Hello everybody, this is Scott Master K and today we're making a video on how using a loop can be easy. In this video we're going to cover a few different things. The first is going to be how to use a, properly use a loop and how to make it easier for you. The second thing we're going to cover is what is a loop? What are some of the different types of loop uh, loops that, you, that are out there for sale? And the third thing we're going to learn is the different dynamics and the, the science behind actually using a loop. Okay, so in this part we're going to be covering the optics of a loop. This particular loop is a Balsh & Long's Hastings Triplet 10X loop. Now, I took the lens out of that loop and I placed it right here under the microscope so you'll have an opportunity to see what a triplet is. Okay, now let us take a look at what makes a, a, the loop most important and that's going to be its optics. This particular lens that's underneath the microscope is called the Hastings Triplet. The Hastings Triplet is a, per, is a corrected lens. In some loops that you buy online, they'll have a single one-piece lens. And that's going to be, have chromatic aberration. It's called color fracturing. It's kind of picture, when, when light comes in one end, one end of the uh, lens, think of a hurricane spaghetti model. They just kind of go in their own direction when they come out the other end. And what that does is when it comes out the end where you're looking, it you lose the ability to focus and you also lose the ability, you, you have a lot of hazing and blurriness around the edges of your loop. That's what happens with a single loop lens. With a double loop lens, it's called achromatic. What they do is they, they glue two pieces of lens together and then that, that what usually does is it brings a couple of the colors into alignment. Usually a lot of your achromatics would have like your red and blues but at the same time, the rest of the spaghetti model is doing its own thing. Now, it's a much clearer image. It's probably one of the more popular, cheaper loops to get online. Uh, probably usually in the, that $7 to $10 range, is having a double. But it doesn't give you true color, and it doesn't really give you a true image. The other thing is that when it comes out this back end, when, when light comes in, this is where the object you're trying to focus on, this flat area is called the field of view. On a single lens and a double lens, the field of view is always curved. On a triplet, it's actually a flat field of view. You actually have perfect color matching and everything draws into focus. Just think of that one spaghetti model that's coming in and every one of them is in agreement and they're all hitting to the same point. One of the key things we're going to have to learn is to use both eyes. And I know what you're thinking. There's no way. I like squinting when I'm looking at something. I can't focus. I absolutely, even when I shoot a gun, I close one eye. I'm going to tell you right now, you do it every day. Many of you already have a favorite position when you lay up against your, your spouse. And you notice when you're watching TV with one face buried, you, that's the eye you're actually using. The same thing when you're laying in bed with your favorite pillow and you're watching television, you're using that one eye again. What it is, it's called the dominant eye. Your dominant eye is the one eye that your brain allows to process, the, process information. So to learn which eye is your dominant eye, we're going to have to do a simple test. Okay? So we're going to have, first what I want you to do is make a couple L's with your hand. What you're going to do is you're going to make your, a little spot. So you got a circle, and what you, and as an example, pick something in the distance. And then what I want you to do is just kind of focus on it. So you, now you see it nice and clear in the opening. So the next thing this is called the triangle method, and you're going to bring it slowly to your face. It gets about here, your brain does a little rope a dope on you, and all of a sudden you start bringing it close in one direction. Now I've had I know a lot of people who are right eye dominant. But I actually have some of my scouts that were left eye dominant, but they were right handed. That old wives' tale that if you use your right hand, you got a right eye dominance. If you lose your left hand, you got a left eye dominance. Is about makes about as much sense as when you swallow a watermelon seed, it uh, a plant grows in your stomach. We're going to talk about how to properly hold the loop. A loop's got a built-in case to it. The proper way to, to hold the loop is to put your index finger through that ring. Now I got massive hands so there's no excuse that your, your finger won't fit. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this loop and we're going to place our thumb on it with a slight arch. Okay, I don't know if you could see this L that we're going to create. 
The third finger is going to help support the first. So you got a three finger sandwich here holding this loop. This is going to be the most important part because this part is the part you're going to put up against your face. And this is going to create what they call eye relief. That will be the distance between your eye and the actual lens of the loop. So now I'm placing it on my, on my cheek and I'm going, to, I'm going to use my tweezers as an example and I'm going to bring it in to focus. Now what I just did was I'm anchoring this part of my face to the loop by placing this permanently on my cheek. Now what you can do is you notice when you bend your thumb even more, okay, you notice there's a distance gets closer or farther away. You're going to find the right point of eye relief when, while you're doing this. And what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up, that's just going to be your ground. You're always going to have it set like that. And this is really important in order, because in order to focus on an object, the eye relief has to stay constant and you're going to be bringing in the object you want to look at in and out and as it gets closer and farther away that's what creates your focus to the object so I don't know if you noticed real quick when I was using the tweezers I used two hands now it's no different for those who play golf you learn how to use a grip so both hands work together and and that's what it's gonna be the same thing same thing if you're firing a gun you learn to use two hands a loop is going to be the same way. You need to have your hands working in coordination to make it the easiest way possible. So once again, we're going to create a bridge and we're going to place. Now for those who do have an opposite eye domination, you are part of a large group and of, our, of those that are out there and there's nothing weird going on. What you're going to do is you're going to take the, your dominant hand and bring it up to that. You're still going to leave your eye open. Now believe it or not, I'm focusing right now on the end of my thumb, no problem with my left eye. It's a lot more comfortable for me, especially over a long period of time, to use my dominant eye. But you could use both eyes. So the next part we're going to do is we're going to, once we established our eye relief, and eye relief is the same thing as, a, as when you're shooting a rifle. You put, your, you put your face on the butt cheek, your eye stays a certain distance away from the scope. And that's it. If you, if you move back or move forward, your shot's off because your scope was sighted in for that particular re relief. On most loop loops, the eye relief is an inch to an inch and a half. On a triplet, I would imagine that's pretty close to about an inch and a half. So now the opposite side of eye relief is called the field of view. We covered that briefly. With a triplet, your field of view is flat. It doesn't have that fisheye effect when you're looking at an object. So now what we're going to do is we're going to learn to anchor our second hand. I'm going to use another pair of tweezers. This is a Peridot uh, semi-precious gemstone. It's a birthstone for August. Now I, a lot of people like to tuck them in and just press their hands together. I know guys will sit there and just use a loop and they'll actually use it one hand and they're using their these two extra fingers. The ones that aren't doing anything. I always use them. I always lock them up. So now I'm pressing pressure against it with the loop. I, I can carefully just turn it and what I'm doing is to get in and out of focus, okay? In a gemstone, gemstone's not like a coin. Gemstone's actually see-through. So light's coming in from the back, and when you've got your, here's your eye, okay? And you have your relief of your actual lens. And then on this side, now we're gonna bring this to the lens, on this side is the object. When you bring it in, it say it gets to focus, and you keep going, now it's out of focus. What it, in, on a solid object, an opaque object, you're looking at the surface. So it does go out of focus as it comes closer. But when you're looking at a gemstone, what happens is when you come into a certain point and the outside of the stone gets in focus, you keep going farther and now something amazing happens. You're looking at clearly at the inside of the stone. The focus continues. Now on a 10x loop, you've got probably the best range for your, your field of um, your field of focus. So what we're going to do is we're going to, once again we're going to bring it in and we're going to bring our objects in, in and out. Once you've got your thing you can move it around all you want. We're anchored. Both hands are anchored together. I'm relaxed. I could do it. I could talk to people while I'm doing this which I've done many many times. It's it, you know this is the whole point of the way you use a loop. Same thing with a coin. We're going to go into using a coin. Using the pads of your fingers Place the coin in the middle of the pads, not on your fingertips. I'm going to, it's going to make sense to you. 
place the coin in the middle of your pads and what it does is it allows you to rotate the coin back and forth so you can actually see multiple sides of the coin so once again picking up our loop putting my index finger into the loop setting up my thumb I got my thumb supported I got my coin in the fat of my pads and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pinky and I usually just bring it right behind and hook my thumb bring it right up against that second finger and I'm going to tilt it and rotate it back and forth and I'm in perfect view right now notice both my eyes are still open and I could say I could look for doubling, I could look for different marks, I can look for errors. This, um, especially for a worn down coin, and you're searching for that date. Once again, it works for it works a lot easier on nickels, dimes, pennies, because you got more of your pad that you could circle, move that coin a lot farther. So these are basic dynamics of it. Your focus comes in from bringing the object to the loop. Your loop is set on your cheek, so your, your eye relief is non-moving. Now, if your eye relief suddenly starts getting out of focus, this is what you're doing. You're making a rookie mistake, you're, you're moving your thumb. Just keep it, keep it still, keep it in one position, and move this second hand in and out. Use your hands, work together, and you'll be using a loop like a pro. I know you might be saying, Scott Master K, hey, my eyes are still kind of wigging out and I want to squint. Well, what's happening right now is you're reteaching your brain something it already knows. It knows how to take that information and make it comfortable, just like laying down or laying up against your sweetheart. So it's just a matter of allowing your brain to train itself. Within hours, you'll find that you're never going to want to squint again. It just won't ever feel comfortable again always using two hands there is no correct way I use pinkies to lock pink fingers in I wrap my pinky in to pull objects in uh, once again I'll do that with a penny show you what I'm talking about I'm bringing up my loop to my cheek I'm set notice this pinky comes out like I'm drinking tea I hold it around the back of my thumb right now I'm looking at a Canadian scent and the details incredible I slowly rotate that back and forth I can get I can actually see deeper into it farther away that's the concept behind using a loop okay next section we're going to talk about is where to get a loop and what loops to look for okay so in wrap up I, the one thing I want to cover is if you got glasses and you're gonna you're gonna use glasses when you're doing it what are you gonna the easiest way to do is on your, th your fingernail you're gonna actually anchor it onto the rim of your glasses Anchor your thumb onto your cheek, put your thumb nail against your glasses, and you could also bring it in and out of focus the way you need to. The other things I want to also mention is a lot of people won't ask about these 20 and 30x loops. 10x is all you need. A triplet will outperform, you know, in magnification and clarity any cheap 20 and 30x out there. A good quality 30 and uh, 30x. Is, is very difficult for a beginner to actually do it because their field of view comes in so close to the object and if you're using coins you, you're probably going to have a really hard time having light brought in. So the last thing with the lighting, always keep the lighting behind you, above your head, coming in from the side. This way you're not casting shadows with your hands onto what you're looking at. If you're looking at a, a, sea, a gem, you want the, the light behind it coming in from the back. The other thing we're going to talk about is the uh, is eBay. I'm not a big fan of buying loops off of eBay. Um, it's hit or miss, especially coming from China. But there are a few, and there are not many, but they will say it in the descriptions. There are a few sellers who will go out and buy a lot of 150, and they'll end up throwing 30 of them away that were junk, and they'll sell the other 120. And usually what they'll do is they'll add a, a 2 or $3 extra to the price, People look at it and go, well, there's 15 of them selling the same item and he's the highest. Sometimes the guy selling at the highest is already guaranteeing that he already sorted through the junk and that'll be in his description. Just something I learned over the years and it's worth a look. The, now for my personal recommendation, recommendations for a loop, um, I would do go with a gym, I'd go either with the Jamoro, the VIP line that's going to run you in the 20, 25 range. I would go with the Balsh and Lum Hastings. That's the same loop that I used in school. Paid $140 for it 20 years ago, and now the exact same triple uh, Hastings loop is is now going for roughly in that $35 to $40 range. 
they're timeless. The other one is a Belomo. They're, they're usually in that 25 to 40 range. They're really good quality. So my personal feeling inside a loop, well, as a gemologist, I'd say spend the extra bucks to be in that $30 range and you'd be happy. All right, so that should be a wrap, folks. We The one last thing I want to mention is also I will be putting out other videos, how to identify fake gemstones and also gold and silver. And keep an eye out for that. If you have a subject you want me to cover, just uh, send me a an email at scottmasterk at aol.com put in the header q a with smk and fire away send me a question give me permission to use your name or however you want me to say it i want to thank everybody for taking the time to watch this video and may the great scout master of all scouts be with us until we meet again